Welcome to That Entrepreneur Life, a podcast about entrepreneurship that takes you from idea to launch and beyond. Beyond. Each week, your hosts, Andrew Lees and Clint McPherson, discuss different business topics aimed at adding value to any entrepreneur's journey. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of That Entrepreneur Life. I'm Andrew Lees, and I'm usually joined by my co-host, Clint McPherson, uh, but today I'll be flying solo. Uh, today, I've got Mike Acker. Mike, it's an honor to have you on the show today. Before we launch into everything, can you just quickly tell us you know, who you are and what you're all about? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on the show, first of all, Andrew. Definitely. So I'm a coach, a speaker, and an author, and I help all of those ultimately to help people realize their potential through mm -hmm. my books. I'm hoping people bring out their best through my speaking. Same. I want to bring out the best in them. And then coaching, I really get to work one-on-one -on -one or through a program to help people bring out their full potential. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. So let's kind of go rewind a little bit and go back to, you know, where everything started for you. Can you take us back to, to where your entrepreneurial journey started and what is it about entrepreneurship and business that gets you excited? Yeah, I think often we, we start the journey of being an entrepreneur from seeing someone else and that gets mm -hmm. us the bug. And then we want to go ahead and do it. We like the idea of starting something. So really that that's in my blood. My dad started something in the seventies. He was a pharmaceutical entrepreneur. Okay. He was a, he was a drug dealer. Okay. <laughs> true, true story. Yeah. He, okay. uh, he learned how to fly planes and how to speak in Spanish. So he could go down to Columbia and other places to buy drugs and fly it back up to the United States and sell it. Wow. wow he made okay. more money than he could with his law degree. So he did that for a while. Eventually okay. he switched over into a, a, another entrepreneurial adventure and started a coffee company, did that. And even at the age of 65, he started a law practice. So wow. he's done this multiple times in his life. And so I saw that early on. I was too young to know okay. about the drug years. Right, but right. I did see his <laughs> coffee company. I did see some of his nonprofit work. So I had okay. that bug in me, right? So then I went into some nonprofit work and I started up some different adventures, started up some food banks, started up some mission organizations. And then I went over to corporate America. And a lot of people who are in that nine to five type deal, really for me, it was more like a 60 hour week job. Mm -hmm. It was occupying so much of my time and didn't give me the freedom that I had. Sure, it paid great, yeah. but is life just pay? And can I get pay by doing something that is more enjoyable to me that mm -hmm. fits me? So those are all some of the some of the breathing points that just breathe life into the dream that I eventually launch out with. Now on okay. the side and what I originally wrote to you about on the side, I was at a spot in California in between all of this where I started a side hustle. I think a lot of the mm -hmm. entrepreneurial life starts with this, hey, I'm doing this thing on the side, mm -hmm. my hobby grows. Yep. Well, I had been coaching people in communication for years. So I'm just doing this on the side, really came down to one month we needed $500. So I reached out to some people that I'd coached in the past and said, hey, can I help you out? They said, great, that'd be fantastic. And that's how I got started. Wow, okay. Yeah, I mean, sometimes just reaching out, especially to old clients or people you've helped before, yeah. it's amazing what kind of business you can you can get from that because they might have been thinking about it, but you know, maybe dragging their feet. They might have you know, been thinking, hey, I need, I need some help here, but then you reach out at the right time yep. and, and you are able to, um, to, you know, to kind of get what you need and help them out. And they get, you know, they get further along in their journey as well. So yeah, I think that's, I think that's really cool. And something that, um, you know, that people should keep in mind that, um, that, that sometimes just, just reaching out to old, old clients, um, or right. even, you know, friends, people, you, um, you're not sure if, if they have a need for your product or service, but they might, and it's free to ask. So I love right. that. And right. really the worst case scenario is that they say no. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And we've got to get used, you know, as entrepreneurs, if you're going to start a business, you've yeah. got to get used to, to, to people saying no and like comfortable with it. Yeah. Kind of like, it's almost excited about, all right, I'm going to get a couple no's here, 
but that's just going to lead to a yes somewhere, you know, or if you get so many no's, it gets kind of ridiculous, then maybe you're, you need to change something. And that's also very, very important. So. Right. um, Yeah. That no is, is more important than we like to give it, give it credibility for. So I was even, I did a recent teaching on YouTube. Finally, after all this time of coaching people, I've been putting some of that on, on YouTube. And I, and I talked about how to embrace rejection. What does it mean to (laughs) embrace rejection? You know, we run away from it. We try to hold it at arm's length, but really to embrace it when it comes our way to embrace that. No in sales, I was in corporate sales, right? So Mm -hmm. for sales, we always learn this no means next Mm -hmm. and always in the entrepreneurial life as well. No means next. If that didn't go well, what's next? Yeah. That doesn't mean get out. It just means what's next. Right. Yeah, I agree. And it does mean sometimes evaluating um, what the, what the motivation of, of people is. And, um, you know, there's at the end of the day, you, you need somebody to, to have a, a need. And so they've got motivation. Um, they find value in your, in your product or service. So you're not overpriced. Sometimes it's, it's bad to be underpriced because, yeah. you know, then, then they're not value valuing your, product to service enough. But if you can, if you can get those couple of things, right, that's, that's kind of it. And you're not, and understanding that you're not going to be for everybody is, is super important, you know? And, and sometimes when people say no, it's, it's really, it's really a good thing. I, I've learned that I've seen a few clients, um, I've given them quotes to do jobs and kind of thought, I don't know if they're going to be the best person to work with here, you know? And then they say no. And I'm kind of like, that was, I think I might've dodged a bullet there, you know? Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. It can be okay. Um, so, so how, um, were were you always comfortable in front of a crowd, you know, as a communications coach, you would think it's just, you were just kind of, I think a lot of people might look at what you do and think, oh, he was sort of born with that ability to just be so confident, be in front of a, a crowd of people. And, um, you know, and teach? Is that something that you've always been comfortable with? Or did you have to learn that? Yeah, great question. No, I wasn't always comfortable with it. And I've had to overcome that insecurity at multiple times in my life, in different stages. One of the things I think that has helped me with the programs that I do with the books that I write and with the coaching is simply that I'm not a guy who already knows how to do it naturally. I had to learn how to do it. I'm still learning how to do it. I'm not the perfect orator. I'm learning. And so I think that helps people relate with me and go, Oh man, if that guy did it, then I could do it. I literally had a review yeah. on one of my books that said, oh, man, if that guy did it, I can do it as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Yeah. I think that's, um, that's good for, for people to know when we were talking offline a little bit, we were talking about just getting started and just getting over the hump of, you know, there's, uh, we've talked about it on the show before about imposter syndrome and not feeling like, you know, not feeling like you fit, maybe not feeling like you you're good enough to provide the product or the service that, that you're, you know, that you're trying to provide. Um, but I think at the end of the day, if you're helping people and if you're learning with them, if you're willing to learn, and and grow then you're you're gonna be okay um i mean and i I think that's really that is really good for for people to know that you're always you're always learning like that expert that you see in front of you talk you know coaching you teaching you is still learning they haven't figured everything out and um and when and when they think that they have then they're in trouble so you know, I think it's, that's, I think we, we really do all have, a lot of us have a tendency. I definitely do to, to think, man, that, you know, that person knows everything. I know nothing, but, but no, there's some healthy balance, you know, they know more than me, but that doesn't mean that they know everything. And so it's, um, it's okay that they don't know everything too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things I try to do in even connecting with, with people I'm working with is letting them know a little bit of the journey that I've been on a lot of the clients that we have are from around the world and 
some of them have moved to the United States and they're trying to overcome this accent issue. And I always tell them, mm. embrace your accent. Yeah, your accent yeah. is part of you. Only you need to remove or reduce your accent if your accent is getting in the way of people understanding what you say. Mm -hmm. But as a marker of who you are and your background, it's a powerful part of your story. So I oh, lived yeah. in Mexico for seven years and had to learn how to speak in front of people all over again without people making fun of me. Hmm. It was part of my story. Yeah. So I speak Spanish fluently, but along the journey, I did not sound so great. So people were laughing at me. Anytime I got in front of people, yeah. people were laughing at me. So that yeah. was part of there's these three different times when I was a kid and then as a teenager, then as a young adult, where I had to learn how to overcome insecurity in those different environments. Yeah. Wow. And, and learning another language um, while you're trying to, to teach or, or learn or, you know, um, that's that's amazing. I mean, my hat definitely goes off to, to people who who can do that, um, you know, who can speak multiple languages, who can go into another country and learn, you know, learn another language. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really amazing. My, um, my mother and father-in-law uh, are from Argentina and Brazil and, and they moved here, uh, they moved to New York and, um, and didn't speak, you know, perfect English and had to learn that on the fly. And, um, I have a huge amount of respect for that and how, you know, how they were able to, to overcome that because that's, that is not easy going to another country and, and figuring that out. So, um, yeah, I can, I can understand that being, you know, being a huge challenge for you when you went to Mexico. And then were you at that time, were you coaching or were you trying to, to, to do coaching in, um, in Mexico or what, you know, I have clients in Mexico now, but so I went to Mexico, I was turning 11. Okay. Yeah. So the, the story as a kid that I had to learn how to speak in front of people was that I had a speech impediment. So I couldn't say certain words, certain sounds I can, can say, but apparently I was very motivated as a kindergarten first grader to figure that out. I wanted to be understood. So I took it very serious. Yeah. And then I worked with my mom on a regular basis to overcome that eventually speak in front of people doing, doing the different things that you do as a kid, the science fairs and such. Yeah. And then at, just before I turned 11, moved to Mexico and then had to learn in Spanish and didn't come easy for me at all. So some people, it comes natural. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes people are so naturally gifted that it gets in the way of their actual becoming their best self because yeah. they just rely on the giftings. They don't teach themselves. Yeah, but yeah. I had to work on that for about three years, four years until I really became fluent, fluent in Spanish, which is a long time yeah. especially as a kid. Oh, sure. And, then, and you want to learn as a kid. I remember always wanting to to know something within a couple of days of learning it, right. you know, like, hey, I just started playing baseball two days ago. I want to be the best. Right. Like, and my sister, to make matters worse, she learned it quick. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, here she is learning it really well. My dad speaks it and my mom and I are struggling. And yeah, I'd yeah. get up in front of people and I was actually quite of a reserved kind of cautious, shyer kid. And I'd get in front of people and start talking and everybody laugh. Yeah. Because I was just hilarious, right? My accent was just, <laughs> just yeah, ridiculous. Yeah. And I used all the wrong words. Yeah. And so how could they not laugh? So no judgment on them for laughing, but it didn't make matters worse for me. So I actually leaned into that identity as a class clown. Okay. But it wasn't really who I wanted to be. Right. It wasn't until really the end of my high school years there that I had found my voice and took time. And so, I mean, even to take that right there and apply it to entrepreneurial and to communication it takes time and we got to give ourselves grace and we got to mm -hmm. give people grace around us. We feel like are judging us. We can't yep. cancel them out. Like our culture is so quick to do. We got to learn how to give grace to ourselves. We got to learn how to give grace to others or else we're not going to grow. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely agree. Um, it doesn't happen overnight, whatever, you know, whatever you're doing, whatever business you're working on, or if it's something, you know, personal or learning a new language, it just, it just takes time, but it does take getting started and it does take, um, consistency. Yeah. So I think the, I feel like those are the, the two most important things to just get right. And you can outpace anybody. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was interesting when I was a couple of years ago working on the side, just with this hobby, reaching out to people, mm -hmm. I, I made some money. Hey, that was fun. Let's keep on doing it. So I kept on doing that and it wasn't, it was because I kept consistently doing it that I'm doing it today. 
It yep. wasn't that I just did it for a little while and made the money that I need to make and then moved on. I kept doing it. And even when I moved then into the corporate job, I kept doing it while I was in corporate sales. So often I would wake up at five o'clock in the morning, coach someone at 5.30, coach someone mm. at 6.30, back to back. Then at 7.30, I'd get ready, hit the road at eight. And then I'd be on the road for nine hours doing sales, 10 hours, come home, finish up any sales stuff say hi to my family, hang out, play with my son, wow. put him to sleep. And then I'd coach for an hour or two. Yeah. And it's because I did that consistently. Now I didn't do that every single day, but there right. were days that that was exactly what my life looked like. Yeah. And because I consistently did it. And likewise in communication, some people come to me, they say, Mike, I want to get better at communication. They dive in for one session, expecting that they're going to be good. Going, going back yeah. to you as a baseball player, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Ex exactly. Yeah. You need a, you need a few coaching sessions. Yeah. Um, yeah. You uh, need a few yeah. coaching sessions and then you need to do the habits. It's like, right. if you want to get in shape, you don't go to a personal trainer, work out with them one, two, three times, and then go, now, why am I not in shape? Yeah. You, you work out with them as many times as you need to know what you now need to do, but then you got to consistently do it. Exactly. Yeah. I think there's actually, I've used that, that analogy before with working out because it's yes. so, it's so tied to, you know, to, to getting something done in business. It, it's just, I mean, um, it, if you just, yeah, if you do it once, you're going to get, you're not really going to see any results. Um, I also compare it directly to, uh, we we're also talking offline a little bit about content and how important content is to, you know, to have out there to, you know, help attract customers because you're, you know, you're trying to, first of all, help them with this, with this content, but you're also, you're creating a presence and, um, you know, and you need to do it consistently and you're not going to put one epic blog post out there and then, that's it. You know, just like you're not going to go to the gym and have a, a great day, be sweating your butt off. And, you know, you think, oh man, I killed it. I'm going to see some results. Like you're not going to see almost anything, but in, you know, if you have not even an epic, you know, day at the gym, you have, you know, you spend 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes and you just pretty, it's pretty good, but you do it a couple of times a week over years. It's like that adds up tremendously same thing with with business those little things that you do maybe you um you know if you're not thinking if you're not talking about content writing you're uh maybe you're you know creating an automation for your business something that's going to help you um right. help you do more or spend less time stressing about your business make it more efficient more cost effective um, you might make one little tweak and that has, has a big ripple effect down the road. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Consistency. There's so much to be said about it. Mm -hmm. You don't want to come into a podcast like what you launched, the yep. consistency that you've had over the course of a year. I think about sometimes we, we think back about what I did mm -hmm. and we relive the past. Well, I, I did this. Well, that, that's yeah. great what you did then, but what are you doing right now? Very rarely do people care yeah. about what you do did unless you're still doing it yeah <laughs> funny thing when it comes to podcasts i started a podcast check this out in 2003 wow in 2003 i mean think about it yeah if i had kept doing that all this time that podcast would have been one of the highest ranked podcasts just yeah we'd be sure term about, of doing it yeah, yeah. We're talking about mike acker instead of joe rogan you know <laughs> yeah. 100 million dollars <laughs> For Spotify. Yeah. yeah I, mean, I stopped. I stopped. Right. And that was the, that was the issue that yeah. there's a lot of things that we start and stop. And really the entrepreneur life is not just doing something for a lot while it's not launching. It's maintaining. There's a lot more to maintaining in the entrepreneurial life. It's a lot more to maintaining communication. There's mm -hmm. a lot more to maintaining and leadership and so many other areas of life, health and then, than starting yeah. Yeah. 2021 is coming up and a lot of people will be starting stuff and then they'll stop the maintaining after two, three weeks. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It'll, the, it'll be the new year's resolution to do whatever it is that, that people wanted to do. And then, yeah. And then February, March hits and, um, and, and, you know, it, and people might stop, you know, doing what they're doing. It's very, 
Yeah. Uh, it happens a lot. And, you know, I think, so what do you think? I wasn't, I wasn't playing. I had another question um, that I wanted to ask you, which I still will, but uh, before I do, I mean, I, that, that brings up kind of an interesting point about what, how do you know when you should kind of um, cut loose and, and stop doing something because there definitely are times I mean, I think this is one of the, the hardest things that, uh, about being an entrepreneur is what do you keep doing and what do you, what do you stop? You know, what do you, how do you know when like that podcast, for instance, just wasn't right for you and maybe wouldn't have ended up, you know, gotten you to the point where you want it to be. And how do you know when it's like, it, it sucks. It's, you know, it's not getting you the results you wanted in 2003, but you just, stick with it and you keep going and you're not really sure exactly if it's going to work out, but how, how do you figure that out? What, what would work? I mean, how did you figure out that your business was going to work out instead of just maybe like, ah, oh, I'm making some money, but I don't know if I can do this full time. Um, right. I think that's a really tough thing to, to figure out as an entrepreneur. Yeah. I think a lot of times in entrepreneurial life, there are some stories of just amazing they started something, took off right away, and then they just had to groom it. Mm -hmm. Most of the stories, though, do not start with that. Most yeah. of the stories, there's a grind for a period of time. But right now, the CEO of Spanx is getting incredible attention. But if you listen to yeah. her backstory, I mean, she was working all day and then packing boxes at night. Mm -hmm. And it was it was a grind. I mean, Jeff Bezos, yep. extremely rich, Elon Musk, but there was a season where it was extremely tough. Yep. So there's almost always going to be a jump and there's almost always going to be a risk when you step out, whether that was stuff that my dad did, my family did, whether it was something in my twenties, there's always almost going to be a risk, but there's should be a sense of calculated risk where right. you look at the market, you look at your expertise and you are jumping into it, but you're not jumping in completely blind. People who jump mm -hmm. in blind, they tend to, no matter how much they go at it consistently, tend to not succeed and end up failing. I think the entrepreneurial yep. life is a lot like the Indiana Jones movie where there's the chasm between where he wants to go and where he's at. Yeah. And there's a riddle that says there's a path that will lead him there, yep. but it takes him stepping out. So there's a calculation, like there's a prophecy that says that I can do this. Yeah. The but walkway will appear. Him. Yeah. 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 You got it. Uh, yeah. And yeah. yeah, you have to, step out there. And then when he does step out there, he finds that there is ground. Mm -hmm. Also, when you jump out in an area, you might end up shifting multiple times before finding the lane that you're actually supposed to be in. So I shifted mm -hmm. from originally the, the area that I was working in was more just like general life coach. Mm -hmm. And then I realized I didn't want to do that. And yeah, so I yeah. shifted into the people who were talking more about business. And then I shifted even from communication into executive coaching. And then I started working with more large level leaders than just someone who's trying to figure out how to make a goal for themselves. So okay. there was varying shifts. And I'm sure that there's probably going to be more shifts to come or more lanes I want to add on. Sure. Okay. Right. I mean, cause you can do a couple of things you can, um, instead of, I think it's important to focus, you know, have, have narrow your focus on something. And, and it sounds like you have, you focus your, your ideal client, you know, you, right. you're figuring out who that is. Yeah. Um, and so you're focusing on them, but that doesn't mean then that you couldn't, as you grow, you couldn't have a new segment market segment that you're, that you're able to also focus on in a different way, in a more targeted way, instead of having this, you know, casting this broad net, um, right. trying to catch all these different segments with one message, you, you might be able to, to add on different segments as you go. Yeah. What I found out was that really the people that were best served by what I could do were professionals who wanted to move up in their career okay. yet had gotten stuck. And the two areas they got stuck on was either their leadership or their communication. And those two go hand in hand. Often mm -hmm. a great leader is also a great communicator. And a great communicator is a great leader. 
those two are so, so tied together. So if I can help people break through in those areas, then I can help them realize their potential, which is the whole mission statement of the company that I eventually founded out of this hobby that I created. Now, okay. as I went along, I realized that I had really chosen a lane to run in that I'm going to work with professionals that, that are really upward mobile professionals. They could be of any ethnicity, any background, any background socioeconomic and any place around the world, any language that mm -hmm. that does not come to play. But the, what they have in common is that they're professionals who want to move up. So some of the people I have are CEOs who are doing incredible things, but they still want to do more. One of the guys sure. I work with is in multiple countries with his company and he's got a brand that would be recognizable. However, he mm -hmm. still wants to go up. So how do you help those people keep going up? Leadership and communication. Yeah, along the way, I realized that there was a group of people I was working with who wanted to build their platform, but that wasn't what I was doing over here. That was, okay. a, that was that wasn't another lane to add on. That was another highway. Yeah. So yeah. I actually started huh. another highway, reached out to a friend and said, what if we do this together, but you take point. So then we started okay. a small publishing group. But then all of a sudden now we have two different companies. They're not, they're not just an addition. So many entrepreneurs, as they get going, they just keep on adding things because they're mm -hmm. looking for more revenue streams. So they've got this really complicated highway yeah. instead of having a highway that goes down a couple, three good lanes. Yep. And then eventually maybe even a different highway. So that's that's the route I took. Yeah. And I'm still new into this journey in terms of doing it full time but it's been an incredible learning. And I, I had 20 years of working in other jobs that really allowed me to, to investigate some of this before sure. doing it yeah. myself as well. Well, it's important to have, to have that experience and, you know, have those years of, of learning about business and about leadership and all these things that, that can help you with your consulting firm. And I think it's smart the way that you, I think it's smart the way that you're growing it and it's, I'm sure it sounds like it's in a, you know, sustainable way, which is really important. And in, in a way that serves the client the best too, because they know right. they're going to, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be really good at this one thing. Maybe your business partner is really good at another thing that can help, you know, other people. So yeah, that's, that's smart. So, I mean, yeah, I wanted to ask you, cause you have a, a really impressive client list, uh, looks like you've worked with people from Apple, Microsoft, Oracle, just to name a few. Um, right. From a business development standpoint, how did you get to that point where you could attract that kind of those kind of clients? Yeah, I took the the clients that came to me at first that were not in those type of positions. And I worked with them and I wanted to work with them as if I was working with the CEO of a large company. So okay. I treated it like it was real in that sense. I treated it like it was dynamic. I didn't wait till I got the ideal client to begin to work as if I had the ideal client. Okay. Yeah. So treating it like what I thought it was going to become was a huge part. I think even you hear mm -hmm. that in stories of other entrepreneurs who from the get go, they acted bigger than they were. Mm -hmm. And acting like you eventually want to act is a huge part of it. From the okay. get go, you need to be thinking about this is who I want to be. This is how I want to be perceived. Most times I have a suit jacket on in my office because that's the type of environment I work in. Even if I'm just sitting at this computer desk, I'm dressed up. I got my hair done. I got my suit jacket on because that's the type of environment that I'm appealing to. Okay. Working in. So acting like that is a, is a huge part. Mm. Well, when you, when you act like it, now I'm not a huge, a law of attraction type person where you just think it into existence and it comes right. to you. <laughs> you know, right, right. People take that quite serious. Yeah. There is an element to, if I'm acting like that, people are going to see that in me. If that's part of who you are, people are going to see that in you and be drawn to work with you. So sure. that ended up happening, but not only that, it also it really changed the ways that I got out there. I'm not really on Instagram. I'm on Instagram personally, but mm -hmm. if someone were to follow me on Instagram, they're just going to see more pictures of my family. It's not a business platform for me. Right. The business platform that was more relevant to what I was doing was more LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So choosing the areas that you're going to go out and be in. 
And then the third aspect of, of your answer there or your question is that I put a book out there and the book got, I wrote a book and the book got noticed mm-hmm. by Forbes.com. Okay. I spent a lot of time focusing and promoting that book. I still promote that book. I'm promoting that book right now. Speak with no fear. Yeah. Yeah. It's got, <laughs> Love it. it's got, got to check it out. It's got almost 400 ratings on Amazon. It's wow. got notice. Well, when that book got more and more notoriety and more and more recognition, well, that help people who are top level go, this guy isn't just a guy who put out an ebook for me. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the products that you create have to really feel like they belong in the hand of the person who wants to buy them. Recently, okay. I saw that Cardi B got, got um, made fun of or something, got criticized for buying that $88,000 purse. Is there <laughs> any purse, any purse that's worth $88,000? Yeah, I would say none. none. <laughs> none. <laughs> yeah, yeah. None. But the why did she buy it? Well, partly why she bought it is because it costs eighty eight thousand dollars. Yeah. And so she wants to be seen as she's in this top echelon of people who can buy purses and shoes and such. And right. She wants to see that. So that person who created that purse, they're making a huge markup. It didn't cost them eighty eight thousand dollars. It didn't even cost them a thousand. Mm-hmm. It cost them very little to make that. They could have sold it for more, but they know who they're appealing to and say so they put the value at it. Uh, the value for my coaching, both yeah. hourly and programs, are more expensive simply mm-hmm. because we're not going for the person who's fresh out of college trying to get a job. Yeah. Yeah. It's, going it's... for something else. Exactly. And and knowing that is important. Knowing who you're appealing to is, is really important. And there's, um, the people are going to, uh, like executives, let's say, like if you're, you know, a higher level executive in, in a larger business, you're going to, you're going to understand the value of, of working with somebody who really can help you get to that next level. And I think, I bet it, it helps to have somebody outside of their organization who they can trust, who they can work with. Right. I mean, yeah. um, I'm not, uh, it's, it's been a while since I've worked in uh, a larger corporation, really just my first job out of college was, was with a large company. I, I did engineering work for them and it just wasn't for me the whole you know, office politics and, and all, and all that kind of stuff, which I guess I didn't really have to deal with too much office politics as an engineer, but if I (laughs) wanted to really advance, you know, and be on the managerial side, I'm like, man, I I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm just not sure that, that this kind of thing is for me. Um, but I, so, but I can see there being some, uh, I can see it being sometimes difficult to, to grow just by learning from the people that are directly around you. And especially in a company, you know, especially in certain corporations, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And often what they're doing there is they're just kind of checking a box mm-hmm. and a lot of companies they're saying, come to this training and then, okay, now you're trained. Yeah. And we got that box checked, yep. but that's not really how most growth happens. It, it It's more of a longer engagement. So I'm yep. working with one company in Florida here, and instead of just having me come in for a one session and just work with them and do a workshop, we're doing a longer engagement over the course of time. Mm-hmm. It's going to have a combination of some in-person work and some virtual work, but that helps people much more than just showing up, going back to our workout yeah, example, yeah. just showing up at the gym one time and doing like a four hour workshop on how to get fit is not as helpful as, maybe one hour and then, you know, one hour next month and one hour next month while that person's working on it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you can kind of, um, uh, leverage, you know, if you're leveraging other people's time and resources and you know, that that's, that also helps a great deal. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's definitely an interesting journey. And I think communication, entrepreneurship, leadership, all these areas have so much in common that there is take what you know and put into action Mm -hmm. and you don't have to know a lot. Just act on what you do know. There is a saying that I used to talk about that depth is doing depth is not learning something brand new. That's mysterious and esoteric. It's actually learning something and doing that 
So yeah. I might not know everything about nutrition, but I can know that eating more green is good. And so I start eating more green. Yeah. That's more helpful than me knowing a whole bunch and not doing any of it. Yeah. And likewise 100%. in leadership, entrepreneurial work and communication, take the things that you know and do that consistently and you you see great results. Yeah. I I totally agree. Even if you're even if you're doing 10% of what you could be doing, it's better than than the 0% you were doing the day before. Um and and I a lot of times I find you know, sometimes I feel like, man, I'm being really productive and I'm really working towards my goal and I can feel that. And then sometimes I really can't feel that at all, but I just, um, I try to just keep kind of grinding through that and, and working on whatever it is I'm working on, even if I'm not excited about it. Um, and then a lot of times what I'll find is that at the end of the day or at the end of the week, I'll look back and be like, oh man, I, I made so much progress. It didn't feel yeah. like I did at the time but I made so much progress. I'm going to keep doing that. It, it, or if I keep doing that, and even when I don't feel like it's working, it's going to, you know, the results are going to come. So I think that's, that's really important to kind of keep in mind. I, I have to uh, remind myself of all the time. Yeah. Yeah. There's a saying that when it comes to writing, keep mm -hmm. your butt in the chair. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And a huge part of work and accomplishment and success is just keeping your butt in the your, chair. Yeah. Or, and that's, or that's standing hard. in front of the, whatever it is that you stand in front of. Right. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> just staying there, keep your butt in the chair. And, and people ask me, Mike, how'd you write the book? Well, every day I got up and I, I sat down for an hour and some yeah. days that hour was way more productive than others. And some days it was not as productive, yep. but every day I did it. And I did it every single day until the book was done. The rough draft was done. And that's how I wrote the book. And that's how you get the job going forward. Yeah. That's how you, that's how you get that promotion. You know, yep. that it just keep on applying what you know and applying what you're learning. Yeah. It's not pretty, but it works. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, so it's an interesting journey. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Mike, you know, I feel like I definitely uh, could talk to you for, for a while here. So we'll have to have you back on hopefully uh, when, when Clint can also join us to be, you know, we, we really, really love to have you back on and, and talk more about all this stuff. Uh, but as we wrap up this episode and we just, you just gave some great advice. Um, but to wrap up this episode, is there anything else, if you could give one piece of advice to, to our audience to help them on their entrepreneurial journey, what would that be? Yeah. One of the strategies I talk about in my book is you be you. It's a huge part of speaking confidence, but it's a huge part of being an entrepreneur. Don't try to do what someone else is trying to do. Don't try to be someone else. Be yourself. Learn who you are. Study yourself. Mm -hmm. Really get intimately acquainted with what makes you tick and what doesn't make you tick. So okay. you, it might it might excite you to overwork. It might excite you to be a five hour person and have lots of spare time. Yeah. Find your uniqueness, find who you are and stay true to that area. Then in the yeah. end, you don't create something that doesn't look like you at all. Yeah. So stay true to you, stay true to your interest, stay true to what you're good at. People will most likely buy from you the things that you're good at, not the things that you want to be good at. Mm, so that's create advice, something yeah. that's in your realm of natural or personal expertise. I love that. And yeah, and do it in your way because people are attracted to, to other people who are genuine. You know, I think, mm -hmm. I think, um, it's easy to, to see when somebody's genuine and when they're not. So, uh, and then whatever, whatever it is that if you know yourself and what you're going to do and what you're not going to do, I think that's also important because going back to the, to the gym analogy real quick. Um, if, uh, you know, if playing football or playing basketball for three hours is the thing is that's the way that you need to exercise. Cause that's the only way that you can get it done then, and just going and lifting weights doesn't work for you. You know, you might do it every once in a while, but you're not going to be consistent. Then it's more important to do, to, to be true to yourself, like you said, and do the thing that's going to keep you in the chair, you know, going to yeah. keep you doing what you need to do consistently. Yeah, absolutely. Agreed. Awesome. I, I love that. 
Well, guys, I think that's a wrap for this episode. Mike, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day uh, to join me and adding value to what we are doing on our podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. I look forward to meeting Clint as well, Andrew. Absolutely. Yeah, no, we, I really appreciate it. Uh, guys, thank you so much for listening to That Entrepreneur Life. To learn more about what Mike is working on, check out his website at steps to advocate steps to advance.com. Uh, we'll have a link to, you know, to that in the show notes. If you like what you heard today, make sure to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or any other major podcast directory. You can also find us on all the socials and on our website at that entrepreneurlife.com. That said, we also want to quickly give a special shout out to our family and friends to include all of our listeners, followers, and subscribers. Thanks for continuing to support what we do as entrepreneurs. And don't forget to join us next time, next week for another episode of That Entrepreneur Life. Thanks for listening to That Entrepreneur Life podcast. Be sure to visit thatentrepreneurlife.com to join the conversation, access our show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode as we continue to add value. Until next time.